My first victim was a woman, white, well-dressed, probably in her 20s. I came upon her late one evening on a deserted street in Hyde Park, a relatively affluent neighborhood in an otherwise mean, impoverished section of Chicago. As I swung onto the avenue behind her, she seemed to be a discreet, uninflammatory distance between us. Not so. She cast back a worried glance. To her, the youngest black man, a broad six feet two inches with a beard and a billowing hair, both hands shoved into the pockets of a bulky military jacket, seemed menacingly close. After a few more quick glimpses, she picked up her pace and was soon running in earnest. Within seconds, she disappeared into a cross street. That was more than a decade ago. I was 22 years old, a graduate student, newly arrived at the University of Chicago. It was in the echo of that terrified woman's footfalls that I first began to know the unwielding inheritance I'd come into the ability to alter public space in ugly ways. It was clear that she thought herself the quarry of a mugger, a rapist, or even worse. Suffering a, a, a bout of insomnia, however, I was stalking sleep as a, a, a softy who was scarcely able to take a knife to a raw chicken, let alone hold it to a person's throat. I was surprised, embarrassed, and dismayed all at once. Her flight made me feel like an accomplice uh, in, in tyranny. It also made me think and, and, and made it clear that I was indistinguishable from the muggers who was occasionally seeped into the area from the surrounding ghetto. That first encounter and, and, and those that followed signified that a vast, unnerving gulf lay between nighttime pedestrians, particularly women, and me. And I soon gathered that being perceived as dangerous is a hazard in itself. I only needed to turn a corner into a dicey situation or, or crowd some frightened armed person in a foyer somewhere, or, or make an errant move after being pulled over by a policeman, where fear and weapons meet. And they often do in urban America. There is always the possibility of death. In that first year, my first away from my hometown, I was to become thoroughly familiar with the language of fear. At dark, shadowy intersections in Chicago, I could cross in front of a car, stop at a traffic light, and elicit the thunk, 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 thunk of a driver. Black, white, male, or female hammering down the door locks. On less traveled streets after dark, I grew accustomed to, but never comfortable with people who crossed to the other side of the street rather than to pass me. Then there were the standard unpleasantries with police, doormen, bouncers, cab drivers, and others whose business is to screen out the troublesome individuals before there is any nastiness. <laughs> I have remained an avid night walker. In central Manhattan, the near constant crowd cover minimizes the tense one-on-one -on -one street encounters. Elsewhere, visiting friends in Soho, where sidewalks are narrow and tightly spaced buildings shut out the sky. Things can get very taut indeed. <laughs> Black men have a firm place in New York mugging literature. Norman Potteritz is famed or infamous 1963 essay my Negro Problem and Ours recalls growing up in terror of black males. They, open quote, were tougher than we were. More ruthless, he writes, 
as an adult on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. He continues, he cannot constrain his nervousness when he meets black men on certain streets. Similarly, a decade later, the essayist and novelist Edward Hoglin extols a New York where once quote unquote Negro bitterness bore down mainly on other Negroes, end quote. Where some see mere panhandlers, Hoagland sees, a mugger who is certainly screwing up his nerve to do more than just ask for money. But Hoagland has the New Yorker's quick hunch posture for broken field maneuvering, and the bad guy swerves away. I often witnessed that hunch posture from women after dark on the Warren-like streets of Brooklyn, where I live. They seem to set their faces on neutral, and with their purse straps strung across their chests, they forge ahead as though bracing themselves against being tackled. I understand, of course, that the danger they perceive is not a hallucination. Women are particularly vulnerable to street violence, and young black males are drastically overrepresented among the perpetrators of that violence. Yet these truths are no solace against the kind of alienation that comes of being ever the suspect against being set apart, a fierce, a fearsome entity with whom pedestrians avoid making eye contact. It is not altogether clear to me how I reached the ripe old age of 22 without being conscious of the, the, the lethal nighttime pedestrians attributed to me. Perhaps it was because in Chester, Pennsylvania, the small, angry, industrial town where I came of age in the 1960s, I was scarcely noticeable against the backdrop of gang warfare and street knifings and murderers. I grew up one of the good boys, had perhaps a half dozen fistfights, and in retrospect, my shyness of combat has clear sources. Many things go into making of a young thug. One of those things is the consummation of the male romance with the power to intimidate. An infant discovers that random flailings send the baby bottle flying out of the crib and crashing to the floor. Delighted, the joyful babe repeats the motion again and again seeking to duplicate the feat. Just so I recall the points at which some of my boyhood friends were finally seduced by the perception of themselves as a tough guy. When a marked coward and surrendered his money without resistance, myth and reality emerge and pay off. It is, after all, only manly to embrace the power to frighten and intimidate. We, as men, are not supposed to give an inch of our lane on the highway. We are to seize the fighter's edge in work and in play and even in love. We are to be valiant in the face of hostile forces. Unfortunately, poor and powerless young men seem to take all this nonsense literally. As a boy, I saw countless tough guys locked away. I've since buried several too. They were babies, really a teenage cousin, a brother of 22, a childhood friend in the mid twenties, all gone in the episodes of bravado played out in the streets. I came to doubt the virtues of intimidation early on. I chose perhaps even unconsciously to remain a shadow, timid, but a survivor. The fearfulness mistakenly attributed to me in public spaces often has a perilous flavor. The most frightening of these confusions occurred in the late 1970s 
in early 1980s when I worked as a journalist in Chicago. So one day, rushing into the office of a magazine, I was writing with a deadline story in hand. I was mistaken for a burglar. The office manager called security and with an ad hoc posse pursued me through the labyrinthine hallways, nearly to my editor's door. I had no way of proving who I was. I could only move briskly toward the company of someone who knew me. Another time, I was on assignment for a local paper and killing time before an interview. I entered a jewelry store on the city's affluent north side. The proprietor excused herself and returned with an enormous red Doberman pincher, straining at the end of a leash. She stood, the dog extended toward me, silent to my questions, her eyes bulging nearly out of her head. I took a cursory look around, nodded, and baited her good night. Relatively speaking, however, I never fared as badly as another black male journalist. He went to nearby Walkingen, Illinois, a couple summers ago to work on a story about a murderer who was born there. Mistaking the reporter for the killer, police hauled him from his car at gunpoint and but for his press credentials would probably have tried to book him. Such episodes are not uncommon. Black men trade tales like this all the time. In My Negro Problem and Ours, Potterich writes that the hatred he feels for blacks makes itself known to him through a variety of avenues. One being his discomfort with that special brand of paranoid touchiness to which he says blacks are prone. No doubt he is speaking here of black men. In time, I, I, I've learned to smother that rage, I feel, at so often being taken for a criminal. Not to do so would surely have led to madness via that special paranoid touchiness that so annoyed Potterich at the time he wrote the essay. I began to take precautions to make myself less threatening. I move about with care, particularly in the evening. I give a wide berth to nervous people on subway platforms during the weed hours, particularly when I have exchanged business clothes for jeans. If I happen to be entering a building behind some people who appear skittish, I may walk by letting them clear the lobby before I return so as not to seem to be following them. I have been calm and extremely congenial on those rare occasions when I've been pulled over by the police. And on late evening constitutionals along streets less traveled by, I employ what has proven to be an excellent tension-reducing measure. I whisp, whistle melodies of Beethoven and Vivaldi and the more popular classical composers. <laughs> Even steely New Yorkers hunching toward nighttime destinations seem to relax, and occasionally they even join in the tune. Virtually everybody seems to sense that a mugger wouldn't be warbling bright, sunny selections from Vivaldi's Four Seasons. <laughs> It is my equivalent of the cowbell that hikers wear when they know they're in bear country. <laughs>